Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. More on the erroneous uh, decision by the current government to seek assistance by the IMF. Um, something the Yahapalne Jokers have been doing for five years and because they applied the IMF prescription, they went home for their erroneous attempt to run the country. Listen to this lie. Naya gavi meng arabu dia visi dah ni, muka dia naya gavan atau ramat atau sengketa tawat tadu eno, seni kata ini meng tawat pahale ano. Deng IMF kat ano kene banku kat hilal naya hilal ano agi. Itu business plan nak ni tu naya IMF kat hilal beri kut ni. Naya deng ikutok kene rata. Ia urudde April masa ini, api bagai mana perasaan ati buna seni kata kiri meng triple C, kene api deng double C berita beri lati ni. Iklan pertiwi kata kiri meng sakat cawat elu buna. Masa hayeng e sakat cawat i beri bela. Iklan seni kata kiri meng hilal ano. Muk sengketa tu godan aguna perasaan beri Argentina mat take mai kare. Egla ni tawa dah besar mudahlah. Dollar billion asu hatak betara. Pratibhi warga tak kara. Masa hatre. Esa kaccha ni mak kalla rata goda awa. Why I say this is a lie is pretty simple. Did you hear that part where he said, "Oh, Argentina went to the IMF and within six months everything was fixed, and they were doing very well." Here, listen again. Argentina mat take mai kare. Egla ni tawa dah besar mudahlah. Dollar billion asu hatak betara. Pratibhi warga tak kara. Masa hatre. Esa kaccha ni mak kalla rata goda awa. All right, excellent, Mr. Dimel. So Argentina might be doing absolutely fine right now, right? Debates about refinancing have been ongoing for two years, something that has caused widespread protests and frustration. <laughs> It's embarrassing. They gave away our sovereignty. Every three months, the IMF will come to audit our accounts. Aside from that inflation, the cost of transport, of gas, of wheat increase every day. How are we going to afford all this? The government says that an agreement with the IMF is crucial to stabilize the economy that is currently struggling with exchange rate controls, inflation rates and poverty rates. But these people here say that an agreement could force the government to implement austerity measures that will have an impact in their lives. Thousands of people in front of the presidential palace demanded the government to prioritize the people instead of the IMF. People here are extremely concerned about the impact that the agreement will have in their lives. <sighs> this is how these liberal jokers lie to you. I mean, just imagine, this program only reaches the English-speaking audience of this nation. So you have the privilege of being aware of these bull, these goons utter to a camera as if they have the silver bullet. With the information presented, you would have the ability to make a calculated decision to rethink when these jokers would speak again as if they were our Lord and Saviour. What about the rest of the nation, especially the low-income earners who cannot look for the information, seek the truth, or understand what we are saying because of the language barrier? For them, what they see is a white-looking dude speaking in Sinhala with an English accent. Oh my, May Mahatya knows what he's talking about. Blind faith. Okay, once again, let me break down what really happened in Argentina. Argentina is a nation that has uh, had around 22 negotiations with the IMF. In the economic world, Argentina is known as an IMF junkie. In March of 2000, the IMF agreed to a three-year $7.2 billion standby arrangement with Argentina conditioned on a strict fiscal adjustment and based on the assumption of a 3.5% GDP growth in the year 2000. And that year, that was a projection, but the economy actually declined by 0.8%. IMF said it's going to grow because they gave the money. It declined in reality. In January of 2001, Argentina continued to show weak economic performance and it prompted the IMF to top up the March 10, 2000 agreement to, uh, by $7 billion, additional $7 billion for what uh, they gave before. Uh, it was all part of a $40 billion assistance package involving the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, Spain and private lenders. The agreement assumed GDP would grow by 2.5% in 2001, but it actually declined by 3.7%. Decline. Uh, in December of 2001, Argentina defaulted on its foreign debt. The Argentinian president at that time, Rodrigo Saar, 
who's just been elected by the Argentinian Congress, announced uh, that the, uh, the country is going to default on the $93 billion. Um, that is an Argentina's uh, sovereign debt. Rodriguez Sá ha also had to resign soon afterwards, thereby increasing political instability even more as many of four different presidents tried to rule Argentina in December of 2001. Within a very small period, four presidents came to power. The Congress was uh, electing them because nobody could do anything about their economy. They took the IMF prescription. None of them manages to remain in office. Why? Because their predecessors listened to the IMF and applied their solutions and failed. Meanwhile, later in 2018, they go back to the IMF because most South American countries are known as IMF junkies. All they do is whenever they don't have any money, IMF. In that agreement, the IMF required the government to tighten its budget uh, by around 4.4% of the GDP from 2018 to 2020 to restore market confidence. It had the opposite effect, causing the markets to shrink. The IMF had projected positive growth of 0.4% uh, for the year 2018 and 1.5% for the year 2019 under its program. Instead, there was a recession with GDP growth at minus 2.6% and for 2018, a minus 2% 2 for 2019. You can see the IMF comes with, you know, very colorful models to predict prosperity for all these countries who takes their pill. In reality, it doesn't happen. In addition, poverty increased over 50% in Argentina during that particular, the, I think, the latest program. Now, when the pandemic hit, the situation worsened with GDP falling by 9.9% .9 in 2020. In addition, uh, an IMF uh, internal evaluation released in uh, December 2021 expressed unprecedented criticism of its 2018 loan agreement and conditions. IMF criticizing IMF. Right now, people are protesting in Argentina, asking the government not to go to the IMF. It's too late. They already went. Still, there is no hope. I wonder whether uh, organizations, these think tanks like Verite Research and Advocata have a branch there because those politicians in Argentina are begging on their knees for another bailout by the IMF. Now looking around the world, we see a trend where people of those individual nations are selecting conservative minds to run their nation because these liberal ways of governance have failed. Even in Sri Lanka, it failed in 2019. It's sad to see that the current government, who had a good thing going, was dumping it all out due to public pressure that stemmed from an issue concerning the disruption of the supply chain. And instead of rectifying it, listening to liberal goons who have now infiltrated the finance ministry. Our real problem lies with our trade deficit and fixing it would be the only solution. We need to not depend on the world this much. We must move away from dependency to getting, um, getting from the rest of the world and make sure that they rely on us by transforming our economy into a production economy. This is what we have to do urgently. I'm now joined by a uh, renowned Sri Lankan economist, Dr. Kenneth De Silva, who knows a thing or two about economics. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for joining me. Always good to see you. Now, Doctor, the current Sri Lankan government when it came to power, the Whistlers of Prosperity actually had a steady economic plan that was uh, going in the direction to help us to stand on our two feet. Now, suddenly, due to shocks from the COVID pandemic, we see that the entire thing collapsing. We are resorting back to steps taken during the good governance, which we all know failed. What is the rationale to seek solutions at an institution that has failed 16 times in Sri Lanka? Please explain this to me, doctor. Uh, well, Mahesh, that's a very good question to start off with. Uh, let me first break this down into two parts. The first part, just to give you an idea of why production requires uh, a macro framework that was proposed in the Vistas of Prosperity. And secondly, to understand why we are shifted uh, now to an institution that we have approached 16 times and had uh, dire results. So we'll answer those two uh, 
simultaneously. So the first point being uh, the vistas of prosperity, as you rightly mentioned, looked at production economy. And the production economy predominantly focus on a gradual shift to industrialization, which is a, which has been a, a, a prerequisite for any country that's serious about lifting its GDP to about seven to eight percent growth, uh, without which uh, this country has no future in terms of its overall growth growth trajectory. So, for that particular framework, you require price stability. And I think that was the key component that uh, the government tried to anchor down. I know some of the policy makers were very serious about anchoring down price stability. And the price stability variables, two key variables were the exchange rate and also the interest rate. So if you look at the vistas of prosperity, you will see that it mentioned that there was going to be a stable or predictable in exchange rate environment and also single digit interest rates. Now those two have a much deeper policy framework beneath it and, and, and to enable that there was a lot of policy actions that were put in place to ensure that uh, inflation story remained consistent and as a result of that consistency inflation remained low and as a result of inflation remaining low we saw inflation actually averaging around four and a half to five percent and as a result of that particular environment you found interest rate stability coming across the board right down to the long term interest rate uh, curve. So that was useful and I think the benefit of that particular low interest rate regime was uh, felt and uh, absorbed by the business community. We saw people uh, getting back into uh, investment and investment activity gradually picking up and that was a good sign for Sri Lanka's overall production and industrialization journey. The exchange rate also is similar uh, uh, requirement because when you have exchange rate volatility, that volatility has to be passed through into various goods and services and in turn inflation also uh, it tends to pick up because Sri Lanka does import quite a bit of inelastic goods uh, into this country. And therefore any movement in exchange rates or excessive volatility in exchange rates causes uh, the overall misalignment in the macro variables and also brings about uh, a much more seri serious impact into the real economy because prices have to be readjusted. So those two variables were the key focus and I think a lot of policy measures are put in place to address that. Yes, we had a situation where it was not foretold and foreplanned as it were in terms of what happened with COVID. Many expected COVID to be a short term uh, or very short uh, period where uh, economies will be impacted, but it didn't turn out to be that. It, it spread across about a year, and we found economies uh, closing down their borders, and even as a result of that, the tourism sector was impacted, and that tourism sector is a key component of your overall national cash flows, and when you lose about $3.5 billion, you have to work on contingency plans. And now, as a result of those contingency plans, there were a series of other policy actions put in place to look at how best you can manage your overall balance of payments, particularly the trade account deficit and the overall current account. And I think that was where the deviation took place in some of the overall thinking process. And as a result of that deviation, we found ourselves going back to the IMF in terms of how we are going to adjust the overall economy as a result of this cash flow shortfall. So the IMF, as you rightly pointed out, is no solution to this. There is a solution on the table. I think people should have really looked at that solution because this solution was tabled at many, many forums and many policy uh, uh, makers were given these solutions. Uh, it was a question of them acting on this, but I think they uh, had a bit of uh, 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 reluctancy to act on it and as a result of that delay in the process we had no other option but I think now looking at an alternative way to fund this uh, uh, imbalance in the overall balance of payments. Now lastly I want to tell you that the, the point that people talk about in terms of bringing the IMF and there was no solution is not true. There is always other options as opposed to seeking the IMF. And I think some of the options, I myself have been uh, coming to media and saying this, that there are bilateral arrangements because our bilateral 
external debt book is much more greater than the short term commercial debt and that bilateral arrangement need to be pursued vigorously if you have to come out of this and that was a possibility and I think that needed some leadership to take place and if that happened I think this particular move towards IMF could have been withstilled and also could have been prevented and I think uh, I'm happy to see that some of the bilateral agents uh, uh, agreements have been revisited and there is discussion around it but I think that's a little too late now because we are already committed uh, to the IMF program. I was told that yesterday there was a draft agreement in place uh, so I think we are gone in a little too deep uh, to turn back and reverse the course that we are currently in. What you say is absolutely right, Doctor. Now, if you were advising the current finance minister or the present government, and if the goal is to get out of this crisis and not fall for another crisis, what should Sri Lanka do at this time, in your opinion? <laughs> good, good question again. Uh, well, I mean, we've been discussing this uh, with, as I told you, many policymakers. Uh, I think if you look at the trade imbalance itself oh, uh, over the last uh, decade or so, you'll find four main countries account for about 50% of our overall trade, namely India, China, Singapore and the UAE. Uh, so we, it's in their interest to see that Sri Lanka continues to engage in trade and this, the vibrancy of trade continues. So I think we should have and still could have approached these countries and looked at more bilateral arrangements via the uh, trade credits, uh, there can be uh, a structured loan in place, there can be many other off-balance sheet guarantees that could come in place where Sri Lanka could access uh, capital via these off-balance sheet guarantees. Some of it is there, some of it is still possible. Uh, so there are many options on the table. I mean, I, I'm uh, sad to say that we have uh, probably overlooked those options and gone with a more familiar option, uh, which uh, has been the IMF. And remember that IMF has been here in Sri Lanka, uh, not too, you know, not not in the not too late, not in the distant past. If you look at it, 2016, IMF was here. That same prescription has been re uh, uh, resubmitted to Sri Lanka to follow. And if you if you look at what happened in 2016 to 2019, those results uh, speak for itself. If you look at the IMF projections, those projections uh, have never materialized. Um, you all should revisit it and see where, what the IMF has projected for Sri Lanka and where, where is it now. And with you, when you backtest it and see what has happened, you see that the IMF has not done uh, any significant good for this country. So that's why I uh, have been advocating to leave the IMF path away from Sri Lanka. It is a path that has not brought any positive results since 1965. And it, it's shocking to see that people are still advocating and many in Sri Lanka are advocating some dire prescriptions on top of the IMF prescriptions like debt restructuring, which is uh, really utterly dangerous for Sri Lanka. Makes perfect sense. Clarity is what's really required. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, renowned Sri Lankan economist, Dr. Kenneth De Silva. Appreciate it as always.